Hello and welcome to today's Best Games of 1995 edition of the Lord's One Order Talks Shop. I am your host and producer, DM Schmeyer. With me is my partner in crime, the eminent reviewer and games journalist, TJ Hafer, <laughs> and uh, the pseudo, the power behind the thrones of, you know, the the Star, the Stern and Reich and yeah. various other fictional strategy empires Actually, we control. I think Casey is the real power behind the throne. Uh, and not not that she controls the throne, but she just stands behind the throne and waits for someone to drop something, and that's that's her power behind the throne. Yeah, absolutely. Know, and get demands to get let in and out of the room, and in and out, and in and out while we're, we're recording Stellaris, so that Brianna gets super irritated having to be the dog wrangler. Um, I think she just is empowered by being wrangled. <laughs> yeah. So it's been an exciting month for the Lord Sworn Order. Plans yeah. are in motion. Uh, growth is taking place. We've got Denver Comic Con yeah. coming up soon. Um, so this is going to go up, and uh, Denver Comic Con is going to happen uh, that Saturday. So yeah. this is your advance notice. If you're there, if you listen to Talk Shop and you're at DCC, we'll be there. Reach out. We'd love to talk to you. We'd love to We'd love to touch base, have a conversation. Um, we're even uh, looking at doing a, a DCC edition of talk shop to go with the 1996 uh talk shop yeah so it's gonna be fun we're looking to we're looking to start being a little bit more aggressive look out for uh, some streams upcoming. yeah you should have by the time this is out we've already started built ramping up our streaming schedule but that's just going to continue yeah um we've it's got not, it's not going to be we're something we can commit to a certain number of streams every week like this week for instance i have way too much shit to do to do four it's streams not even this week something i think we could even worry but even there are going to be weeks that i yeah. am going to have time to do four streams in one week so well, and that's why we're not scheduling yeah. it we're making no promises so we can't yeah. tell you when it's going to occur we can't tell you what day only that it's <laughs> happening and we'll give you as much notice more as sworn possible. order more streams hopefully monday <laughs> that's uh that's our tagline <laughs> yep, and cool. yeah. I mean, we're going to yeah. play some Overwatch, we're going to mm-hmm. play some grand strategy games, we're going to play some military strategy games, there's going to be some more Kerbal, which we are... By the way, we have a poll running for what you guys want to see us stream, and it will be in the comments and the description of this episode, because we want people who actually watch the channel regularly to chime in, and I think the people that watch Talk Shop and After Dark are our, like, most regular channel watchers you, you guys are the ones that watch everything we put out not just the games you're interested in specifically and we appreciate it yeah by the way uh-huh. um one of the other things we're thinking we've been waiting we we momentary we hiatus hiatus yeah um darkest dungeon because the the radiant update wasn't as expansive as we were hoping like when uh-huh. we actually dug into it yeah and uh we saw that you know crimson court was coming out in a matter of months mm-hmm. um and it ended up being literally a month and a half. So now Crimson Court is out, and we want to resume um, Darkest Dungeon. We are debating whether or not to do it as a YouTube show or as a semi-regular, not regular, mm-hmm. but semi-regular, stream. So weigh in in the comments. We would we would like to hear you. Your opinion, um, devoted channel watchers, will actually probably be decisive here. We could literally yeah. go either way. Yeah. Um, and yeah, vote on uh, what you want us to, to stream next. So that's happening. And in the meantime, yeah. we are uh, classing it up yeah. with some Dunkel. With some Varsteiner Dunkel, yeah. It's 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 uh, my classy. It's an import. It's a good German lager. Roasted barley, yeah, bro. Yeah, come on. Roasted barley. It's, you can't, you can't get more imported yeah. German than that. I mean, it is the beer that they serve on German airplanes, but I don't think that necessarily makes it less classy. Are you tasting this? This yeah. is good. This it's, tastes it's good. Stuff. good. Yeah. It, no, I, I, I drink I drink Warsteiner pretty regularly. It, it is one of the big mass market German export brands, but I think a lot of those are better than people give them credit for. Well, German mass beer mm. is not bud. Mm-hmm. Like, they, they know beer over there, and they even but their Budweiser would produced... not be allowed to be labeled as beer in Germany. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Even their mass mark, their mass yeah. produced cheap stuff is of a certain quality. It's not like our yeah. mass marketed cheap stuff it's, that is they, of very they, little quality. They take such pride in the craft of it. It's, it's like trying to find a bad French or Italian wine, which is possible, I'm sure. You but have to look though. Yeah, they they take such pride in it that you it's know. you know it's my biggest advice. It's yeah. like people who wanna you know wanna be sommeliers mm-hmm. to to put a jesting point on it. Like they who wanna dive into wine. They know that I'm, I'm not a connoisseur, but I am something of an enthusiast. I like my wines. I drink yeah. them regularly. Like, what do I do? What do I start with? And my response is always, 
you're not going to taste the difference between the $30 bottle I'm about to recommend and the $18 bottle I'm about to recommend. So go with the $18 bottle, man. Mm-hmm. Like it's the same with cigars too. Is okay, are are the really bad cigars really bad? Yes. Is there a massive swath of the spectrum of cigar quality that lands kind of in the middle where it actually starts being difficult to discern for most people? Yeah. Yes. So why pay the extra couple of dollars a stick? Go with I'm, one that you like that's I cheap. Think, I think we've discussed this before. Like a lot of the reason I would pay more for a cigar is for consistency. Because we've talked before about like quorum. They're usually like, what, four bucks? Yeah. I've and had they're some real, horribly inconsistent. I've had some really good quorums and some really not so good for yeah, it's it's a super yeah. cheapo mm-hmm. cigar occasionally yeah. i think i don't know how because I, I i don't know how they're made but occasionally a quality one sneaks through yeah. like something about the blend yeah. maybe it aged every a once in a while yeah you'll light one up and you're like wow this is really i got that for full and bucks. awesome yeah yeah but i'm like okay yeah. so if, if i'm gonna am i gonna you know necessarily choose a quorum over an esteban carreras chubacabra <laughs> no yeah uh, um <laughs> but Am I going to be okay with you know maybe one of our uh, one of our number fifty nines out there mm-hmm. when I don't have the extra five dollars to pay for a chupacabra? Yeah, it's fine for a seven dollar stick. It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. And if you buy, you know, there that's the type of a number fifty nine is the type of stick where there's it's a seven dollar stick. If you buy them in enough bulk, that goes to six dollars. And if you buy them like we bought them, it goes down to like four eighty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And at which point now you're only paying what we only paid 75 cents or so more than we pay for a quorum and it's an immeasurably better cigar. So the uh, the the moral of this episode <laughs> Costco is, it up. is yeah, you can be classy without spending a lot of money. Yeah. And and in There's, fact, yeah. we're ac- we've actually thought about that for like a short special mm-hmm. edition of the Lore Sworn Order, how to yeah. be classy as fuck on a budget for yeah. 35 minutes. Yeah. Um, because we're both actually very skilled at it. Uh, yeah. TJ has become quite talented at drinking for cheap. Yeah. And I have become twi- quite talented at drinking good wine and smoking good cigars for fairly cheap. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I mean, we, we, we've got some tricks that we'd like to share for you. So if that's if that's something of interest, we'll, we'll put that in the queue. Definitely. Um, and that, that's what we're drinking. And it... Clink the glass, man. That's that's some good stuff. And you know what? We just clinked the glass. It's time to give a toast to one of the stronger years in gaming history. Dude. 1995. This this year is going to make the top five list, in my opinion. Like, what what a titanic watershed year for video games. This is the... This is the year for me. This This is like... If you look at my gaming career... And you juxtapose human history. 1995 is like when they figured out agriculture. 1995 is the year that I went from a kid who played games to someone who would one day go on to make his career in games. This like, was this yeah. was the year I embraced. Like I'm I'm more of a writer. This was the year I embraced games as a storytelling medium. Yeah, and I mean like. We should clarify. We were we were in kindergarten in 1995. So when we say yeah. this is the year, we mean games from this year because we experienced yeah. a lot of the games from 95 and 96 and 97. But it's games from this year that were the turning point for us. And I'm gonna just go ahead and argue it: a turning point for the industry. Like even our honorable mentions, dude. Look at the yeah. sheer quality. Oh, yeah. Of the titles that came out this year, and then let's we're we're getting to a point where stuff that gets relegated to honorable mentions is stuff that could very easily have been like top three. To it just happen to, to be to, blunt, yeah. there is a game on my honorable mentions that would have been a game of the year candidate in '94. Yeah, like not just like a top five candidate. Like uh-huh. I, Yoshi's Island would have been number two or number three on a weaker year. Yeah, bluntly, I it, and I mean it's. This was this was the year that I first had a PC in my house that I had regular access to that could play games on it, which was huge because before then it was going over to friends' houses, it was staying the night at my aunt's. Like that is when I played games. This is the this is the year that I, like I had a device in my house that had games on it that I could access on a daily basis. I'm gonna put it this yeah. way: 1996, uh, in April of 1996, so my birthday, my mm-hmm. sixth birthday. I got three presents that year of April 96. One was a Sega Genesis. Two was a cartridge for Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Yeah. And three 
was a cartridge for Earthworm Jim, and that was my that was really the beginning of me gaming. Yeah, like other than Minesweeper and the occasional I don't know what's going on romps on my cousin's PC because I was four. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So I mean, in 1995, I played these games a year, two years later, in 96, 97, and became a gamer. But it's these games I played, 94 mm-hmm. and 95. I wasn't, when I got the Genesis in 96, I wasn't playing 96 titles. Yeah. I was playing 94 and 95. Well, like, one of the games, the game that's actually at my number five, I didn't play it until, like, a year ago. So, yeah, there are definitely games that came out this year that, that you know, we didn't play. There are games on the list every year that we didn't play the year they came out. Um, but, yeah, 95, very special year for me. Very, very special I mean, year. It's so special, I feel like we've got to at least pay some lip service to our honorable mentions. Oh, yeah. We won't uh-huh. do this every year, as we've said, but we're going to do it for some when it merits it. And the honorable mentions for this year yeah. were good. They deserve a few well, minutes. I think two of the best stand-up arcade shooters ever, which comprise two-thirds of my honorable mentions, Area 51 and Time Crisis... Yeah, like uh, the, those those are some of the best arcade games ever. Um, and they kept our. To be honest, I think yeah. that games like that kept arcades yeah. kind of alive. Yeah, they were major attractions. They cost seventy five cents a continue, which is I, more yeah. than the typical twenty five or fifty cents. So they these were games that made the arcades money. Well, and were attractions. I remember the Time well, Crisis time, and Time Crisis yeah. 2 booths. There were lines, Time dude. Crisis was one of the first... Uh, I think it was like the, the first stand-up shooter I'm aware of, at least, that had the cover system and the pedal, where you would like step down on the pedal to like pop out a cover and shoot stuff, which is really cool. And man, Area 51, I've I've fed more quarters into Area 51 than any other arcade machine. There was a, there was a day... I think I was in like e- either late middle school or early high school. I, I took... Twenty dollars for my allowance. Turned it in for quarters and went and got the high score at Laser Zone in Olathe, Kansas, on their Area Fifty One machine. I'm pretty sure I still have it. If they haven't gotten rid of that machine, if someone in the uh, Johnson County area wants to go down and check that that TJH is still at the top there, uh, I'd appreciate it. Um, I don't even know if Laser Zone's still there. They might have been. Well, I mean, bought and out arca- by... arcading was an important yeah, part uh-huh. of of our yeah. development as gamers, like. Coins were kind of how we, like, five, mm-hmm. six, seven-year-old, you know, DM and TJ measured our income. <laughs> I remember we, we once decided to be really entrepreneurial little shits, and through borrowing from our parents, rummaging through couch cushions, grabbing change from center consoles of cars, like, I remember oh, knocking man. on doors and being oh, like, man. do you have any quarters? And us being like, this no. is the greatest idea. Everyone's giving us do quarters. You remember, do you remember when, <laughs> when we got the idea to do door-to-door lemonade sales? Uh, like we did, we we didn't want we didn't want people to have to come to the lemonade stand. We were gonna bring the lemonade to them. And, and we, what was what we was, went around with an order form what to was see hilarious. how many glasses they wanted. We took down their order and then came back with the lemonade and got the What money. was funny is we thought we were the best, most entrepreneurial little shits yeah, on the planet. Uh-huh. Yeah. doing door-to-door lemonade sales. Yeah. What I now realize as an adult is the adults in these houses were looking at us like these poor homeless <laughs> fucking kids <laughs> literally yeah. on the street oh, starving. Yeah. Give them give them $2, Harold, for the love of God. Look yeah. at them. They're yeah. so skinny. Because we were. We were actually very skinny kids. It was well, genetics. The, the other thing that we discovered that I kind of wish we hadn't is... <laughs> How many people in the like general vicinity of Candleflower answered the door in their underwear? <laughs> Most of them guys. It wasn't like we were getting a peep show or anything. <laughs> no. Like there were a surprising number of people. Fat dudes in robes yeah, and tidy whities in in on a weekday during the day answering their door in their underwear. <laughs> like, that was that was information I could have gone my my whole life without knowing. <laughs> but you know, yeah. we were able to raise fists full of dollars when we put our minds to it, and yeah. we, we used it at the arcade. Yeah. Um. You know, now I wish that it's been like, hey, I just entrepreneurialed my seven year old ass into five bucks. <laughs> How about I put it in a four hundred one k and not in Time Crisis <laughs> two? But such perspective is not yeah. something a child uh, has. Yeah. Also, I think you have to be eighteen years of age to open a four hundred one k, but. That's um, just un-American. <laughs> it is. Yeah, all these damn regulations. We made so much money, we could have yeah. invested <laughs> in something other than Area 51. You know, if we, had, damn it. if we had put five bucks into a mutual every weekend, fund in 1995... Every weekend. We, every weekend. We would have done we a couple hundred We probably wouldn't have to work th- at this point in our lives. <laughs> no. So, 
Kids, if you're little kids and you're listening to this for some reason, which you shouldn't be, because we don't. drink and cuss like sailors, <laughs> um, <laughs> you should go sell lemonade door to, Well, I'm not going to tell you to do that, because that could be dangerous <laughs> in the neighborhood. You find a safe way. To be blunt, it wasn't safe, be, in, ni- it wasn't safe I mean, in 97. It's I don't probably know. less safe in now. In the 80920 in 1995, <laughs> I don't think there are a lot of like child abductions going on, but... I don't know. It's 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 maybe a little bit more street now than it was then. <laughs> like it's it's gone up, you know, maybe one or two points in in the street category. But there's some stop signs with some graffiti on them over there. Uh, man, good times. We yeah. were we were entrepreneurial little shits, man. And you know what we did though? We would come yeah. home a lot from our uh, our ne'er do welling to raise mm-hmm. arcade capital. We would play co op Tyrion. Your Tyrion. other yes. honorable mention game. Tyrion is, I think, I think it's probably the first game we played co-op ever. Yep. You'd be on the keyboard, I'd be on the yeah, mouse. Yeah, you'd rock yeah, it. It was a, it was a multiplayer shoot 'em up where one player could control his ship with the keyboard and one player could control his ship with the mouse, and it was like the little fast, like zippy ship, and then the big clunky ship with the big guns on it, and you could link them up together to like maximize your firepower. It was actually made by Epic, same people who made Jazz Jackrabbit, Unreal, Gears of War. It's a great game. It's a great game. Um, there's a cutscene in the middle that, at the time, very much disturbed me, where a guy gets his spinal cord ripped out um, and <laughs> yeah, wrapped around even, a post. Yeah, we didn't even really know what was going on. Yeah. Um, we're like, wow, that's brutal. Yeah, it's <laughs> like, oh, it was all colorful and spaceships and shit, and now I, we're getting morbid here. And I'm six. <laughs> yeah, we're getting some, some like Lars von Trier quality uh, storytelling here. But, uh, yeah. Fun, um, though. And no, it was a great bosses, little game. Yeah, the variety the, of weapons. There were so many freaking levels. Like, uh, there were, it felt like there were like a zillion levels. They were all super different. They all had really different enemies and, and you know, different obstacles. And, uh, they, I loved the all the different weapons. Was great. Yeah. Like, there were tons. Not just like your, oh, this gun shoots faster. Oh, well, this gun has two streams of and, fire. There were bombs. There well, were laser and blasts. Like, there, there was a limited amount of ship customization in the two-player mode. In the one-player mode, it was basically like an RPG. Like, you were selling your old ships to buy new ships, and you were loading stuff onto them and, you know, customizing all their capabilities and special attacks and stuff, and you'd get letters from your mom <laughs> and, like, other random people in the galaxy on your on your terminal it was uh it was very in-depth for a uh top-down shoot 'em up game a classic it yeah was, we we put some hours into Tyrion, boy yeah this was this was an inch away from being on my top five i think my uh, uh my honorable mentions mainly consist of three more great entries mm-hmm. in the 90s swarm of platformers that didn't reinvent any wheels and and didn't have like the same earth shattering quality as my top five, but are still like really great games. Yeah, Rice Star, really creative platformer, mm-hmm. uh, very unique art style. One of the prettiest Pro- games probably, of that era. Probably a contender for the best Genesis platformer that does not have a hedgehog in it. <laughs> so, I would agree. Yeah. I uh-huh. mean, really, one of the prettier games from that console generation, yeah. and really memorable boss fights that really required you to be on your toes. The final boss of Rice Star is one of the more challenging final platformer bosses I've ever tackled. Super memorable. Yeah. Yoshi's Island, a legendary platformer in its own right, yeah. added the mechanic of having to keep baby Mario safe while platforming, mm-hmm. which made this earn the title Nintendo Hard as a Nintendo yeah. platformer. Um, really interesting, tons of personality, um, really fleshed out actually the Yoshi character yeah. in a way that made him kind of the Mario mainstay other than Mario. Like, the, the Yoshi is kind of his own thing under yeah. the Mario yeah, umbrella. Yeah, it, it kind of started Yoshi as a franchise, yeah. And uh, Earthworm Jim 2 um, takes upon the Earthworm Jim formula and, and kind of just goes balls to the wall with it. I mean, even yeah. more creative stages... Even more creative boss engagements and things going on. Uh, a little prettier, a little bit better graphics. Um, yeah. I disappointed didn't... in the final couple of stages. I thought, to be honest, that's probably what kept it out of my top five. I, I think it's an inferior game because it, it wasn't like it wasn't as charming and funny as the first one. It was almost like they were trying to do 
Earthworm Jim, the Dark Chris Nolan reboot. Like, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but it... it yeah, and it took itself a little bit more seriously as an action game, and I feel like it didn't have as much of the quirky humor that makes Earthworm Jim Earthworm Jim. I would agree. Yeah. And uh, that takes us to our uh, our top five mm-hmm. here. Well. Yeah. Um, I start my top five with uh, Star Wars Dark Forces here. Reason it's not on my list, it is the first entry in a series that I love, but I wasn't particularly thrilled with the first one. See, I, I yeah. was charmed with it like you were charmed by X-Wing and Wing Commander. Mm-hmm. It, it put me in a place that I had fantasized with about just as much as I'd fantasized as flying an X-Wing around. Yeah. Like, give me the blaster, give me the, the leather vest... Gotcha. And put me on the ground. Let me blast some stormtroopers, and I'll be safe because they can't aim. Like so that, in our in our in our collective Star Wars imaginations, I was the flyboy, and you were more of you know the the jarhead. I'd say the gunslinger. The gunslinger. That I, works, I, yeah. I I yeah. I tend to gravitate towards pistols, even yeah. in first person shooters. Yeah. Or shotguns. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Um. No, it, and it it scratched that itch for me. It's a well designed game. It oozes with Star Wars flavor, and uh, my one criticism is it's a little easy, because Stormtroopers can't shoot for shit. Yeah. <laughs> well, and also in the first game, I don't feel like Kyle Katarn was that much of a character. I think he kind of developed a personality more in Dark Forces 2. I'd agree. Um, I mean, everything got better in Dark Forces 2, but yeah, it was, it was not a bad little game at all. So you uh, go, uh, you're number five. Yeah, so my number five, I'm trying to think if I can call this my favorite LucasArts adventure game overall. Um, I mentioned in the article, by the way, you can find the article version of this list on loresworn.com. Most of, I'd say almost all of my other favorite adventure games from the 90s are memorable because of the humor. The Dig was memorable because it was... It was like uh, it was like playing through a really high quality sci fi movie. Um, there's you know it starts out with these astronauts and they're investigating this thing and you don't really know that this whole supernatural adventure is about to happen and you get teleported to this alien planet and there's this big mystery to uncover and all these like twists and turns. It got super dark at some places. The puzzles were pretty interesting. Um, the finale was really cool. You don't quite... I mean, it's it's very Spielberg, and he had a hand in this game, So and, and that's very clear to see. Um, you, you don't get all the answers by the end. It's still kind of mysterious, and, and um, you know, like the ending of E.T., like E.T. leaves, but it's like, okay, we don't really know where what he was or where he came from. Um, it's, it's that same sort of thing. I just thought it was a great great little adventure and i played this for the first time within the last year and it holds up really well see i have never played it i'm thinking i might have to after that yeah i think that it's i think it's i think it's uh it's can't miss lucas arts it's it's part of the pantheon it's extremely well written um the voice acting was uncommonly good for the for the time even today it, it holds up and um just the the pacing of the plot and the different plot beats and how they're presented in such a way that that it escalates and you're taken by surprise multiple times um throughout throughout the adventure i thought it was just very high quality storytelling all the way through yeah. awesome yeah definitely we uh we agreed on number yeah four. number four Mortal, Mortal Kombat yeah. 3, bro. Mortal Kombat 3. Arguably which, the finest Mortal yeah. Kombat of all time. And I, I, you know, I roll into this all of the later updates of Mortal Kombat 3. Fa- which Mortal I think Kombat, is fair. Because Mortal Kombat Trilogy is really the game that I would say is the height well, of Yeah, it's, it's know, the, the, the franchise. all that game really is is the definitive yeah. ideation right. of Mortal Kombat 3. Exactly. Um, yeah, this is, this, is, this is where Mortal Kombat... Um, to, in my opinion, this is, this is the definitive, its competitors. Yeah, this is this is the definitive Mortal after, Kombat. After moment. Mortal Kombat three, you can't you can't put Killer Instinct. You yeah. can't put Tekken. In my opinion, in the same conversation, you just can't. Like this if, game was so far beyond any other fighter that was out. 
the the yeah. depth of the roster for yeah. one. So many, ca- and they were all friggin' different. Yeah, like lots of different powers, I mean, different moves. They different they combos. pulled out they pulled out the stops. There was a, there was a ridiculous number of characters, ridiculous number of you know finishers and special moves, ridiculous number of secrets to find. You know, it was. It was uh, it was the full realization of what Mortal Kombat always wanted to be, I think. And well, and it, to be honest with you, yeah. I think that the franchise survived what would have been a crushingly bad period after Mortal Kombat three, with like three or four mediocre to bad fighters in yeah. a row. That had killed almost any other non Street Fighter fighting franchise. Mortal Kombat survived to eventually deliver a, a a very very good game mm-hmm. towards the end of its uh its original you know mortal Kombat cycle mm-hmm. and then it eventually rebooted and the reboots are phenomenal yeah um but mortal Kombat didn't wouldn't have survived to to reboot to remain relevant if this game wasn't so awesome i yeah. maintain that the goodwill it engendered the legend it started mm-hmm kept the franchise on life support through, let's be blunt, six or seven bad years for it. Yeah, definitely. And, and several weak releases. And really bad movies. Well, the first one was bad. The second one was really the first bad. One the, was char- the first one was charmingly bad, though. Yeah, the exactly. First, the, first the, first one, the first one knew exactly what it was doing, and I think it actually did that well. Yeah, no, it was it was, it was was trying... where you fall down. Yeah. <laughs> it was trying to be a yeah. campy... Uh-huh kung fu movie and it succeeded i actually enjoyed the first mortal kombat if you go yeah. into it with the right attitude uh-huh. mortal kombat annihilation was just awful because it tried to take it, it, it at the same time that the acting quality went through the floor yeah. and the plot went somewhere yeah. not good and the screenwriting decayed it decided well, that that like, was the point to take itself more well, it's seriously. Like, it's not hard, dude. Like the plot of the entire series is that Shao Kahn wants to fuck up Earthrealm, and Raiden's <laughs> trying to stop them, so they're gonna have a fighting tournament. That's it. You don't need to make it any more complicated than that. That's the plot. You're done. You just you all you, all you're responsible for is writing some cool fight scenes, like. <laughs> well, it's like the time to take a series yeah. more seriously uh-huh. is not when everything about it, from the acting mm. to the screenwriting, declines. Like, that is not the time mm. to remove camp. That is the time to embrace camp. Yeah. And they didn't, and it became awful. Yeah. But yeah, Mortal Kombat 3, incredible. Like, I what, like 30 characters? I mean, it's like. I don't some, even remember. Sometimes but I, mean, I would just go random because I didn't know who I wanted to play. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, there and, you you would never get bored of it because if you got bored of one character, there's like fifty more that you can. I mean, and the unlockables. I just remember in the old school Mortal Kombat games how big a deal like unlocking Goro was because it was such this arcane yeah. like steps that you had to do, and it was super difficult. And I miss this. We were talking about the same thing with uh, the Chaos Emeralds and Sonic. Like I miss. Having these like super difficult, you miss the carrots and the sticks, man. Yeah, uh, and and I feel like in in modern games they feel like well we can't just like hide an entire character behind an obscure you know laundry list of things you need to do that you would never stumble onto by accident. You know, it's like no, that's cool though. <laughs> it's cool when they do that, and you have to find out from your friends or from a strategy guide. You know what the super obscure list of things you need to do to unlock the secret character is absolutely yeah and i mean unlocking shao khan yeah that was like mataro yeah and yeah mutaro shao khan and goro that was like if you could unlock if if someone came over to your house and you had all three of those characters unlocked you were a badass immediately yes. immediately you're a, you're a badass yeah you're a stud yeah it's not like today where you go over and like you see someone hasn't unlocked every character in Smash Bros. And you're like, come on, man. If it was <laughs> like... you played it at all? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you don't have Luigi? What the I wanna, fuck, I dude? Wanna get, I want to get my Roy on, bro. Yeah, we're, we're kid, You move aside. I'm going to play single player and unlock some characters for you. So we can play. Yeah. <laughs> you don't even have my main. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, back then it was like... I didn't know a lot of people who had unlocked Shao Kahn. Probably is maybe a 5% chance that any given person would, you know, 
And this was one of those games that everybody seemed to have, too. It was almost ubiquitous, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Mortal Kombat 3, man. Number 4, unanimous. Yep. Uh, We diverge on our number 3s. Yes. Um, But both amazing games. Oh, yeah. Um, My number 3 is Rayman, and yours is Command & Conquer. Yeah. I was the big Command & Conquer guy, though I can acknowledge its brilliance. Yeah. Um, Command, I, I think Command and Conquer is where RTSs kind of grew up. I've had Do, Dune 2 and Warcraft Orcs and Humans on my previous year's lists. But I feel like both of those were, they weren't fully realized yet. They were still cookie dough. Um, I feel like Command and Conquer is where you have cookies. To blatantly steal a metaphor from season seven of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, um, it, it's it's where it's where it you know RTS as a genre, you know, became fully formed and and became the type of games that that we're used to today. And Absolutely, it had it had you know in really interesting economic mechanics. It had a shit ton of units like nothing before. Even another really great RTS that's on both of our lists that for this same year didn't have anywhere near the number of units um, that the original Command & Conquer did. It kind of uh, it, it brought about the era of asymmetrical factions with GDI and the Brotherhood of Nod, which and was really cool. they're entirely different. Yeah, uh-huh. I they're that. very, very different. And uh, that would persist throughout the series and go on to influence such greats as you know starcraft and later warcraft 3 and and i think pretty much every rts now has asymmetrical factions i can't think of another one that does mirror factions that's come out within the last 10 years um as far as rayman goes i'll keep it simple no platformers have more personality than Rayman games, mm-hmm. they are they bleed it, they ooze it, they yeah. it, it is coming out of every pore. Rayman Legends and Rayman Origins are examples of recent games that were game of the year contenders in saturated years mm-hmm. because of how charming and bloody brilliant they were. Yeah, and the first Rayman I think holds holds up with them. It is it has a unique, engaging art style. It is beautifully drawn. The art is absolutely stunning. The, the worlds are so varied and absolutely yeah. drip in personality. A gorgeous sort of mystical fairy forest yields way to a, a land that is music, like musical mm-hmm. instruments that are anthropomorphic and whatnot. And you, you just never know what's coming next. The challenge stays hot all the way through. Rayman games are hard. Yeah. And Rayman himself... I think he's one of the more charming... He's right up there with Mario. He's one of the more charming... I was going to say, I, I think he belongs in that pantheon. Well, I mean, he belongs in the pantheon with, like, Mario and... So- the original Rayman should be compared to Sonic 3 and, you know, Super Mario World. I think that Rayman Legends is comparable to Banjo-Kazooie or Mario 64. Like, yep, They're yeah, incredible. Yeah, uh-huh. They're absolutely incredible. And I love yeah. the powers he has... Yeah. They're, they're, they're so well designed mm-hmm. and, and they always one of the things I always admire and I've got to shout out good game design when I see it because that's mm-hmm. important is they unlock at the perfect time mm-hmm. like you, you don't start the game with the ability to do everything Rayman can do it's a staple of all the games you unlock them as they go and each one is game changing the ability mm-hmm. to hover with the helicopter hair stronger punches with your attack option Mm -hmm. you know all like the ability to swing through the air by like lassoing the the rings um it it, it's all game changing and it opens up new mechanics and new ways of playing and new ways of navigating and surviving the game world as you go that make it never get stale not only is it gorgeous and not only is it you know rayman just a great platforming hero they're masterfully designed games Mm -hmm. they're just really good yeah. Um, I, I'd argue that Rayman, Rayman 2, Legends and or- Origins and Legends are four of the finest platformers ever. Like, if I were making a list of top ten platformers, top ten platformers, Rayman would appear on that list four times. Yeah. I'm not sure Mario would, and I'm not sure Sonic would. And that just speaks That's to the... That's very high praise. I, I, that just speaks to the quality that they put out. Also... 
Ubisoft of France announces its a uh, its arrival here. Yeah. In a big way. And these these guys, if you if unless you know your head's been under a rock, you know. Yeah. These guys are now pretty much up there with EA as power players in the industry. Yeah. Um, mm. I would say indisputably one of the three or four largest developers on earth. Yeah, yeah, I think if you put all their studios together, they're they're definitely in the top five, um, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, great, great little game. Now, um, we do what we do regularly. We agree on the top two, but yeah. we disagree on the order. I think yep. this is the third time this yeah, has happened. Yeah, we, where we've we've had one and two, or you know, both of the, the same games, but we have them switched. Um. So I mean, yeah, we kind of talk about them together. This was yeah. hard. Well, to me, my, this this really was kind of splitting hairs for me. And they're they're such different games that they are hard to compare. Um, but yeah, my number t- or your number two, my number one is Warcraft Two: Tides of Darkness. Arguably the second greatest RTS ever. I I don't know that I would put it in greatest RTS territory just because. It was a very good mirror RTS, but it was one of the last big RTSs to have mirror factions. You know, the Ogre and the Knight have the exact same stats, they just have different sprites and attack animations. Um, The main reason that I think Warcraft 2 is an incredible game and a contender for my top 20 all time, um, it's where Chris Metzen took over as the lore writer at Blizzard and he turned Azeroth into a fantasy universe on par with the any, Earth. Anything you can compare it to, Tolkien. Um, I mean, I, I remember pouring... Star Wars is not exactly fantasy, but this game made Warcraft a pillar for me that is as important as Star Wars or Middle Earth. Like it's it's a core of my media universe because of this. I game. remember pouring over the manual. For Tides yeah. of Darkness. It was like 120 pages long. And yeah. most of it like, was lore. Freaking, yeah, explaining the Burning Legion and, you know, how the corrupted Titan Sargeras came about and all this all this shit, like integrating Warcraft 1, which didn't really have much of a story, but they figured out how to kind of wrap it all together in a and and it and it, it created some truly iconic characters. And that, cool that's, Dan, Doomhammer, friggin' Lothar. Th- this is this is Anduin Lothar, Turalian. F- yeah, and this is the point of origin for something that has become p- one of Blizzard's like bread and butter staple, which which is hanging each of their games on larger than life characters. That started here. It started with Anduin Lothar. It started with Orgrim Doomhammer. Where, like, these guys are fucking badasses, and you're going to have a lot of fun playing as them, you're going to have a lot of fun playing against them, Mm -hmm. and they're going to do overpowered, ridiculous shit that's going to make you go, what? Like, over and over again. They even built to a masterful and poetic plot. Like the, yeah. the Lothar is the beleaguered leader of a refugee people. Yeah. And and his eventual confrontation with Doomhammer to his death with yeah. Turalyon ri- lifting up the hammer to avenge him. It's very Luke and Obi Wan bluntly. Yeah. It's a really well designed plot. You go from Warcraft One, which was as close to plotless as an RTS can yeah. get, and still remain quality, to a game that has bluntly as good a lore and as good a storytelling as most RPGs in an RTS format. It's a staggering accomplishment. I'm, I'm going to have This game is absolutely a contender for my top 20. Absolutely. I'm going to have I'm going to have my most geek out moment ever on Talk Shop here. Just to illustrate how important Warcraft 2 and this story and these characters were to me. I was I signed up for the first Phase of the closed beta of World of Warcraft. And that's not just hipster bragging. That's an important part of the story. When I got to the... Uh, oh, shit. I can't remember the name of the zone now. I'm going to lose all of my my lore credit. It's, it's the zone with, with Blackwing Lair. Um, that's like the volcanic area. Black Rock Spire? Yeah, it's, it's over... It's the zone Black Rock Spire is in. But when I got there, and you see the statue of... Lothar overlooking, you know, Black Rock Spire, where he died fighting Orgrim Doomhammer, and it's in this orc-controlled zone. But this giant statue of Lothar 
holding a sword is completely untouched because it actually is explained to you by a quest giver that the monsters in this zone are afraid to go near it. I teared up a little bit because that was my childhood embodied in this, you know, MMORPG in 2004 that I had no idea was going to go on to become the biggest MMORPG of all time by far. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, Warcraft 2 has a very special place in my heart as a gamer. I, yeah. also, it was just driven yeah. with personality and yeah. things to unlock, even, and yeah. things to do. Uh -huh. Like, finding the demon tomb, glorious. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, glorious. Gul'dan was, was a, a fantastic character, and, and all of his shenanigans were, were entertaining to, to follow. You know, I might need it. to replay Tides of Darkness. Oh, yeah. it's cheap. It just was oh, yeah. probably a ton of fun to pick yeah. up again. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you get that Battle.net edition where you could... There was a chart that told you how many discs you need per number of players that you wanted to play with. They had, like, this weird formula for some reason where not everybody had had to have their own copy of the game to play multiplayer. Yeah, yeah. Man. great game. It was a fantastic Legendary game. RTS, and really the springboard. I, I think this is this game made Blizzard what it came to be. The yeah. lore, the quality... And you see, you mm -hmm. see it in everything. In my opinion, you can even see, you can even see the smoke from it in a game like Overwatch. Yeah, the big characters in a very yeah, distinctive exactly. feel. Exactly. Yep, that all that all follows back to Warcraft Two. Now, my yeah. number one and your number two. It was my number one for the reason that I think it does mm -hmm. deserve to be in the greatest in its genre conversation. Yeah, like Chrono Trigger. Yes. Not a contender for my top 20 games, y'all. This is probably in my top 10. I'll just yeah. say that right here. It's, it's again, it's, it's in the conversation for greatest RPG ever. Yeah. This, what, what, what can't you compliment in this game? From a distinctive and stunning visual style. It's one of the best looking RPGs yeah. of its generation. And the graphics don't age. Yeah. It was so well designed and so well, well animated. I mean, it's Toriyama. Like, <laughs> of yep. course, it's going to look awesome. And it, it ages immaculately. It yeah. will never age. It was so well designed and just so gorgeously rendered that even even though it continues to feel distinctly retro, it's still beautiful. Like, it yeah. still holds up the flavor of the world. Each character is distinctive and unique, and the battle system is genius. The yeah. text, the combo attacks... Mm -hmm. It took turn-based battling, which Final Fantasy had basically honed to an art form at this point, right. as much of an art form as it can be, mm -hmm. and it injected something new and vital that gave the battles a distinctive flair and made even fighting random mooks fun. Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, this is something we'll get into if we ever get around to talking about, you know, Half-Life down the line. I think that it can't be discounted what impact it had that there was no break in continuity of the world between you know the overworld and the battles like the enemies actually appeared on the screen where you were walking instead of like the -la 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 -la, and now we're in the battle screen like it mm -hmm. was it was seamless which i thought was really cool but the main reason that i have to give you know very high accolades to chrono trigger is i think this is where my favorite subgenre of RPGs began, which is, you know, the very reactive story RPGs where your decisions actually matter. Absolutely. Ten like, different endings, bro. When I realized I was playing a special game, the moment that I realized, oh, wow, this is something else, is less than ten hours in when Chrono gets put on trial. And every little good or bad thing he that did at you've the done at the festival... Someone will either speak well of you or speak poorly of you. You know, like, you know, this guy helped me out or this guy was a dick and he brushed me off. And that actually affects how the trial proceeds. Like, I was like, wow, this is, this is something, this is something well, else. It was also the first yeah. game to, to come at you both barrels. I mean, spoiler yeah. alert, Chrono dies. Yeah. Your avatar, the guy you get to name yourself at the beginning. He, yeah. He, your silent protagonist dies and it's in, in, unavoidably so unless uh -huh. you're in new game plus and you kill labos there <laughs> like he yeah he dies well and and it was it was such an intense story like the 
The stakes were super high. You're trying to avert, you had, literally, literally, you're trying to avert human extinction. Yeah, you, you had... It's coming. You it's had, coming uh, in the near future, and you're all that stands between it. That's 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 the height. Yeah, you, you you have you have the uh, this like force of nature villain who is made up to be like completely unstoppable. Unstoppable. Yeah, like he's lit, he's the meteor that killed that killed the dinosaurs, made into a villain. Yeah, like he, he's coming and he's gonna end the world. So a lot of the story doesn't even focus on beating him. It focuses mm-hmm. on stopping him from rising. He's he's put up as that. And I love the moment at the end when they, they come to determination. It's like, no, we have to beat him. Like, yeah. <laughs> there's there's no avoiding it and anymore. And at that point, you're so intimidated by what he's been built up to be that you're like, all right, this shit's going to get real. This is, this is going to be a tough fight. I don't know if this is actually possible. Even knowing that this is a game and games are designed to be beaten, I don't know if this is possible. The just first masterful time storytelling. It's that it's fight, you versus yeah. extinction. I don't yeah. know that any other RPG did such a wonderful job of establishing the the fate of the world type of stakes, yeah. the fate of the world type of plot as Chrono Trigger did. You are hop jumping around time yeah. to save which human existence. Again, you guys that have listened to us for a long time might know time travel stories are one of my pet peeves. Because they're usually done they're, awfully. They're usually done really poorly. I can count on one hand the time travel stories that I would say were done really well. Chrono Trigger is one of those fingers. It's, yes. It, it, was, it was very well done. Well, it's it, because the time travel mechanic, they didn't get bogged down in the time travel. Yeah. Like, there were cool little moments uh-huh. where the time travel could affect it. It's like, oh, you did something in the past right. that changed the present. But it was really more... About the changing in setting. Exactly. Like the moving to, from we, a war-torn period to a peaceful we, period to an apocalyptic yeah. period. And we talked about in Final Fantasy VI, one of the cooler elements of that was, you know, the 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 regular world and then the fallen world. Even going back to, to Link's, uh, Link to the Past with the, the Dark World. Chrono Trigger did that with like seven different like <laughs> iterations. You visit of the world. you visit like so many different versions of the world that it never gets old, and it's this big sprawling adventure across time and space with these super memorable characters who all had really interesting flaws. Oh, and, it was a great party, and that yeah. it wasn't small, but yeah. it wasn't too large. No, it was and tight. Every knit. character had was just dripping with personality. Yeah. From Ayla the cave girl to the warrior Shakespeare yeah. quoting frog. Yeah, one of the, the best w- RPG party members of all time, yep. I think. To, to the robot, yeah. to, uh-huh. yeah. to the dark mage you can either win over or kill. Another yeah. example of your choices dictating the story. Yeah, it was, it, every, everybody there had a really distinct role and so, really something to do. It, it wasn't like, uh, you know, FF6 had some great characters, but then it's like, uh, Umaro, what's his deal? Uh, he's a yeti. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Gal, what's Gal, his deal? he's weird. He's annoying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, there's the girl who paints. I think she had an arc, maybe. Um, <laughs> maybe not. I don't really remember. Realm. Yeah, Realm. That was it. Yeah, yeah. So, no, I, I, Chrono yeah. Trigger. You can't say enough. It's one of the best stories ever told in this yeah. medium. It ages immaculately. Mm-hmm. Um, and it changed things. Yeah. I mean... There's a reason people look back at Chrono Trigger and it still makes... Like, I think IGN had it as either the number one or number two greatest RPG of all time in their list. I I think, uh, I forget, GameSpot or Game Informer did their own list and Chrono Trigger ranked similarly highly. This game is unanimously beloved and universally accepted as legendary because it oozes quality in every in every form. Well, I think it's I think it's fundamental. Uh, it's a fundamental influencer to a lot of the RPGs that are going to show up on our lists in the late '90s and the early 2000s from companies like Black Isle and Bioware. Like I think that this is where the thread begins of RPGs where your choices matter and they're built to have lots of different possible endings. Um, I, I think Chrono Trigger is the point of contact for that. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I know there were some text adventures before that 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 had similar mechanics, but Chrono Trigger was gorgeous. Yeah, everyone played it and they replayed it and they replayed it to get endings, and it sticks with people today. Like the Chrono Trigger section of fanfiction.net uh-huh. is still active. It's still yeah. alive. The fans are still producing Chrono Trigger shit. Damn near twenty years later, and yeah. there there hasn't. 
been really anything supplemental. I mean, there's Chrono Cross, which is received as it was all right for the most part. Like there hasn't been any supplemental that I know of. Like there hasn't been like any well, manga. Chrono or anything Cross based is on. an inferior sequel in my opinion because yeah. it. it shies away from Chrono Trigger too much. Oh, yeah. The point of a good sequel in gaming is to revisit what you love and yeah. improve it. Chrono Cross, actually, in my opinion, the writers and the developers tried to stay as far away from Trigger as possible, yeah. and that was a mistake, is my argument. Gotcha. I've never actually played Chrono Cross, because I've been told it's very missable, so... Um, but yeah, man. Um, 1995. What a what year. A, what a... What a, what a really strong year um Alrighty, our best game olympics yeah so the best game olympics is where we uh, every game earns points based on where it ranks on the list for its platform developer and country of origin um we finally saw this week in in platform uh the nes got knocked out of the number two spot it was the number it, one reigning champion for weeks and now it's it's been dethroned been dethroned by the snes um proving at least so far that the SNES is, according to our data, the best home console up to 1995. Um, Arcade made a made a comeback with Mortal Kombat, Time Crisis, and Area 51. I'm trying to think if there are any other big, big arcade games that could... Maybe Rampage or games it like it will, yeah. will get honorable mentions to yeah. keep it getting points, but... Yeah, Genesis is on the way down. It had its time in the spotlight, but I think it's it's kind of done at this point. Um, and uh, a very important console yeah. debuts in 95 yeah. in Japan, the, and that is the PlayStation. The PlayStation 1, jumping out of nowhere to take the number 8 spot. Um, and it has some rising to do, to yeah. be blunt. Oh yeah, it, it's definitely going up from here. A lot of people forget, actually, that the PlayStation came out that early in Japan. It stunned some people because yeah. Super Nintendo and Genesis games were still happening. Yeah. But it did. Thing was, it didn't have a lot of great content support to it, well, and it floundered a real, little bit. Really, early. the the big thing the PlayStation had was discs. It didn't. It wasn't that impressive in terms of hardware performance compared to like the the Genesis and the SNES. It was. A step below the N64 in in terms of what was actually under the hood, which is funny because Sony has now become like the our consoles are gonna kick the shit out of all the other consoles performance wise company. Um, but yeah, the the original PlayStation, I think it was I think it was only a 32 bit system. Um, but yeah, the big thing was that you could fit so much more on those CDs than you could on a cartridge. Uh. Sugaden, Xenogears. Yeah, Aye. yeah. There's some there's, seriously amazing PlayStation be games some coming. Big ones. Yeah, um, for sure. Developer list has remained very static. Actually, it's still Nintendo, Square, LucasArts, Sonic Team, and then the deadlock between Capcom and ID at number five. Here's the thing, um, though. For the first for the first week, really, Nintendo didn't widen its lead, though. And I think yeah. that's important to point out. Well, and on your personal list, Square is less than five points behind them. Mm -hmm. um, so just Nintendo getting displaced on any, on my list, your list, or the combined list would be a pretty big deal because they've been untouchable. And see, I think it's going to happen. It's yeah. probably not going to happen in 96, but I think in 97, 98, Nintendo's in some real jeopardy. They're yeah. going to still have games on my list, but their they're near monopoly on quality is yeah. evaporating. It's, and I don't know that they're going to be... I mean, there are a couple more notable I, number ones of mine that it'll secure. I think Nintendo's going to finish the 90s strong. Um, I think they're going to get into trouble around... You know, end of the GameCube era into like the Wii and Wii U era when they were just at the at the high water. They were putting out a single really good game like once or twice a year. <laughs> I, I, I can I can be blunt yeah. at the at the at the absolute high water mark of the PlayStation yeah. Two. I might have a list a year where Nintendo doesn't score a single point. I and know that's I where, have lists yes. where Nintendo years where Nintendo doesn't score a single and, point, and that's when stuff is going to get interesting. Yeah. Yep, um, Blizzard. Coming. Number seven. They have more Out to go. Nowhere on, I still don't know uh, if they'll finish in the top three, but I think Blizzard is a strong contender to finish in the top five. I, th I would be shocked if Blizzard did not finish in the top five on the developer list. Um, Nation Wars is a very exciting week because all of the positions have changed. 
The U.S. has finally passed Japan to take the uh, gold medal podium spot. Japan has dropped number two. It's still a margin of less than 20 points. Um, and then knocking the U.K. out of the bronze spot, France, mm -hmm. Ubisoft, and our little buddy Rayman come, come out of nowhere to uh, take uh, take the bronze medal um, for this point in the... And that's going to start to happen more and more. Yeah. We're going to mm -hmm. see new nations join this list yeah. just about every year. Yep. Video gaming is becoming truly global. I I'm I'm trying to predict in my head. I'm pretty sure it's I'm I'm almost entirely sure that U.S. and Japan are going to be one and two in some order. Yeah, I think. Um, Can but Canada is going to make a yeah, strong Canada, play for Canada, bronze. Canada, France, um, Czech Republic with the Witcher games. CD uh, Projekt Red yeah. is. I mean, they've produced very little, but what they have produced yeah. is so unequivocally brilliant. Yeah. They're going to um, score a lot of yeah, points. Yeah, I mean, Sweden is going to score a lot of points on my personal list um, between Dice and Paradox. Um, yeah, it's going to There are going to be some Dice and some Paradox games that show up on mine as well. Yeah. Uh -huh. they're, they're great developers. Yeah, yeah. Sweden has really pretty recently become a big deal in, in that space. I don't know why that clicking is coming from my speakers. I apologize if you guys, if that picked Picks up on up. the micro, micro, microwave, microphone. <laughs> we're recording it's late. with the microwave. Yeah, we've, we recorded a shitload of Stellaris today, and we're, we're getting, getting toward that tail end of the night. So that uh, is a 1995, yeah. a seminal year, a, a year that went yeah. down uh, in, in fame. Like, uh -huh. this, this is the year I do think where not only things change for us, but it's kind of changing for gaming. Yeah. Like, just, just the sheer quality of the games on this list this year. It's like, we're, we're obviously, in my opinion, beginning a new era. Yeah. Where, where we're, we're splitting some hairs now when we make these lists. Oops, that is not the document I meant to open. I was just going to see if I could glance ahead. Because I know I had some 96 stuff already noted down. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think like every year from here on out, it's gonna be a battle. With a couple exceptions, is like holy shit. There was a lot of good stuff that came out this year. Um, what the heck is that clicking coming from? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, we are excited. If you are also excited, you can subscribe to our channel. You can check out loresworn.com, where the written version of this list is available, along with our blurbs for each game that. Tell you a little bit more about why we love it. Um, check us out at Lore Sworn Order on Twitter. I am at AsaTJ and DM is at DM Schmeyer. And keep your eye, folks, on uh, on the Twitch channel, man. Yeah. Because we're, we're coming. And be sure, remember to check out in the description and in the comments the link to vote for what you want to see us and stream. I would love to see any, to play any of these games. I oh, would yeah. love to do a Victoria stream. I would love to do a Total War and XCOM stream. Oh, yeah. Um, and remember, please let us know what do you want out of Darkest Dungeon Crimson Court? Yeah. We're, we're raring, we're itching to get some Darkest Dungeon back on our docket with this new expansion. Yep. And you just need to tell us how. As a video series, as a stream, we'll do it. I mean, I'm eager to give my, uh, I'm eager to give my qualified legal advice to a whole host of poor saps partaking in yep. fantasy brutality. Yep. Uh, Definitely. It's, it's something I'm looking forward to. Definitely. Be well, guys. This one was fun. We're going to see you next week for 1996 and a special edition Denver Comic Con uh, cast where we uh, we talk about that event and uh, what we hope to take out of it. So, yeah. See you guys then.